Between the time when chaos broke Cadia and the return of the sons of the Emperor, there was an age undreamed of. And unto this, Cronan, wearer of the jeweled crown of Aquilonia, upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. And so it was that we rejoin our hero, Cronan, the cunning one, lord of all of Aquilonia. And to be frank or earnest, which is usually more politique, he was going to be more than just a single system ruler now. For in all of the hurly-burly of relating his most close-up camera shots, you know, the fuel-injected high adventure that we have all come to adore. Um, anyways, it is freely admitted that even a chronicler as well acquainted with the source material as I must needs omit some details. I mean, it's not like I share my cataloging of every one of the mighty Cronan's anal exhales, which now stands at 20,323 from the first entry, just for the record. But I dare say sharing my meticulously annotated spreadsheets on the force, bouquet, reach and staying power of said body burps would scant add anything to this retelling of a tale of such magnificence. Just know there is always more for me to relate. In fact, Probably more happens off-screen than on, but the nature of storytelling is getting to the good bit, as all else is for the long, tedious tales of the Humies and the Smeldar, who literally have nothing better to do with their time. I mean, honestly, if one of these foul and noxious runty races can spend resources on supporting anything more than one chronicler at a time, then it clearly shows a lack of prioritization skills and would go a long way to explaining why the Humies and the Smeldar were so absolutely rubbish at fighting. Because their utmost import in any engagement was the defraying of casualties in any, um, fray, and they were missing the point entirely. It would be like spending entire decades to become a fry cook on a world with replicators. It would be like many a chopper made by an immature boy, Pointless, yet obviously not redundant. Well, at least not in that situation, as it could be used as a cudgel, which effectively would just elongate any scrap. Hence, it was always a boon to any youth, as it meant that they would have to put in more willy to get the job done, and a gratuitous application of elbow grease was the key to most good bundles. But the runty races would never understand. These unspeakable killjoys had no idea what a good war was even about. Not really. I mean, the Smeldar were okay at killing things. That could not be denied. And there are starters of the Humies, the Spaced Marines. Well, they were particularly shooty, choppy and stabby. Very fighty. But Cronan again considered that the R starters must have more orc in them than Humi. You see, the Smeldar, Humies and Toe Empire all shared the same singular issue. They were far too goal-oriented. Defend this base, stop that fleet, protect this city, stop this massacre, prevent that genocide, etc, etc, and on and on. They never took the time to really smell the roses. Not that any orc would put it like that, but the statement is manifestly self-evident nonetheless. And as any good proper greenskid knew, when it came to fighting, it really was all about the participation. Anyways, this all adds up to the confirmation that I am not pestering or overburdening the patience of my audience with endless pre-correlated details of little worth, although I am aware that some gain gargantuan mahogany, redwood or oak tent poles from the discussion of logs and sticks. It is still something I tend to skirt over. Not that I am stating that skirts are a particularly important part of this tale, as they are clearly not. I have not even rizzed Admiral Tartan or McMurder for their strangely kilt-like attire, which everyone outside of Malt Whiskey Land realizes is just a plaited skirt. And so it was that elements of Cronan's war were getting antsy at times. 
despite the extravagant, gaudily lavish entertainments laid on by Cronan's Mystery of Truth. Some were indeed grinding their teeth with inaction. And as teeth were the universally accepted currency for the Greenskins, this was viewed by the Cunning One as a potential threat to his economy. Again, since the debacle of the Stork Exchange, we have narrowly even mentioned the Fiscus, the finances of the war. Because it is tedious, and doth not contain either spittle, struggle, or slaughter. Hence, it has been omitted. Sidebar. Multitasking. Ha! See? I remembered. So I thought I'd get it in quick. Now I have time for this exceptional sidebar, as I did not wish to clutter the last chapter, for it can be difficult to remain on point during such a thoroughly chaotic narrative. But one would not expect anything but the most cunning of linguistics to lick out such an important anal, sorry, anal. The ongoing exploits of the cunning one, Cronan. Ergo, which is rarely heard these days, we get to the sidebar proper. For multitasking is yet another skill, facility, mighty power of the most orky of orcs. Now Cronan was all too aware of the import of his time, as has been mentioned earlier. Hence the institution of the rule of three so many moons ago, which really did diminish the amount of boss botherers who now attempted to court his favor. But with first contact rituals and other such matters perpetually on his docket, Cronan's time was even more at a premium than ever before. Thus, even in rare repose, Cronan would be perpetually observing the universe around him, and this, of course, would lead on to being attacked by ideas. And so, Cronan learnt of multitasking while enjoying the matinee Squig Surprise event. For the Lord of Orcs marvelled at not only the sheer carnage that arose as soon as the Grots were teleported into the giant Squigoth pens, but also the economy of action. And Cronan looked on agape as he witnessed the amount of Grots the mighty Squigoths could exterminate in such a short time frame. Their every movement slew scores of the Grots, a foot falling on many, other Grots being thrown into walls by the impact, Others, in their wide-eyed screeching, to be free of the enclosed area, would slam themselves against the walls. As Cronan watched the impaling of four grots on the one horn, the lumen in his head flickered on. For, he now knew, he had to be as a squigos fury. He had to watch his life for opportunities to deal with multiple issues at the same time. Multitasking. Thus did Cronan set to utilizing his time to its absolute optimum. For example, if Cronan was to chastise one of his bosses, he would invite all those who he was even slightly dubious about. Hence, when he tore the head off the rare annoying malcontent, he would also quell many a subsequent rising by making an exhibition of the recalcitrant knob or boss. Strangely, it seemed to really put the loyalty back into his mobs and knobs when he went to town on one of said miscreants. And thus, ironically, proving the ancient Smeldar axiom, it is easier to kill two stoners with one bird, or something like that. In any case, Cronan was now a master of multitasking, and the war thrived due to it. End sidebar. But where was I going with all this? Oh yes, that Cronan had been canny indeed, for he had sent off the most rumbuctious of his flotillas to grab extra turf. Well, the systems themselves were of little use to Cronan at this stage, as he was fully intent on his war, and, like many a leader, he concentrated on that which would maintain his forward momentum and thus popularity with the masses. Yet, inside, even the cunning one had an eye to the future. Well, more on a scan's shifty guards every now and again. But Cronan did ponder that if he did pull all of this off and succeeded in his war, well, it might be nice to have an empire to come back to for a break, obviously, before then setting off on his next campaign of utter carnage. Also, as we have heard in the sidebar concerning booty, Status was indeed a very important thing amongst the bosses of any truly orky congregation. 
And so it was. The Cronan had taken to sending his most dense, independent, or incompetent war bosses off on their own little side missions. And most were utterly ineffective. And were nary heard from again. Yet, even amongst the sorry bunch the Cronan had sent out, there seemed to be a few unlikely winners. Well, more to put it, that there were a few who were not led by total grot lickers. For the mustering of this mighty scrap being held somewhere in the sector had indeed denuded the vast majority of the Humi worlds from any real backbone. Once upon a time, a planetary deference farce, you know, the local Humi fighters. Well, more like part-timers, really. But in any case, they were still present and would usually have been able to resist most orky assaults. Yet, with the guidance of an excellent example, that paragon of battle and victory, Cronan de Cunning, some of the ne'er-do-wells had actually played a blinder. Hence, as Cronan messed about with the Goliath Spacehawk, the Orcs of Omen, he was hardly sitting with his thumbs up his butt. No, he had been conquering everywhere for light years around. It's just that no real resistance of the magnitude to justify an actual description of events was in the offing. Needless to say, Cronan was well pleased with every single victory, heralding them through the mystery of truth, while utterly suppressing the many myriad of total cock-ups that had occurred across the sector. Like, who would really need the nitty-gritty about the self-crumping of Sigma Delta Theta 15? where the entire massed greenskins had mistakenly appeared on two ends of the planet, only to think the other side indigenous non-speed war orcs. Hence, they butchered each other to the last greenskin, neither side willing to forfeit the victory in the name of the cunning one, even when they started calling their enemy by their names whilst mid-clash. Nor would the tale of the Mega Whoops of Wankanda too be worthy of dissemination. For this particularly goofy event underlined the import of coordinating landing sites for major transports. Only tooling being learnt when over two dozen attack sheeps of the line all headed for the same strip of open space before the Humi's capital city. Alas, the many speed freaks in charge of the flying of said transports saw absolutely no reason why they should surrender their obvious right of way. Hence, the landing strip soon looked like a multi-story car park populated by burning wrecks. Obviously, it was a truly side-splitting spectacle to view, yet not exactly the kind of result the cunning one would lord. And it was also something that the mere mention of would send Ducker von Smashhoven into paroxysms of rage. So, Cronan had the evidence removed and the mystery on the hunt for gabblers and grumblers. You know, blabbermouths. Yet, even amongst these utter fripperies, there were potential concerns. The first was the defiance of one particular world. It made even less sense to Cronan than usual. For this planet was barely of note, hardly defended, and mostly, well, pointless really. Yet, even after three assaults, it had held firm. None could quite understand why so many of the boys had been exterminated quite so quickly when there was so little obvious resistance. Cronan decided that the very first place he would visit with his brand new wonderful sheep, the Orcs of Omen, would be this strangely resilient, fern-festooned world of Ramalama Ding Dong 4. The second issue was by far the more grating, for more than a few Orc raiding forces had been sliced to ribbons by Smeldar ships. They would come out of nowhere and rip Cronan's formations to pieces whenever they ventured too far west in the sector. Cronan knew without a shadow of doubt that this could only mean that they were infringing on the space lanes of that redoubtable scoundrel and smelled our pirate admiral, Yanes Blonde. Another whelp for the breaking. Another chapter in the glorious chronicles of the cunning one. Now Cronan had already assigned Admiral Hackbar to be the first part of his larger plans, so he was definitely busy, as he would be setting off as soon as a dozen rocks were ready. Yet, in Cronan's estimation, Grand Mouth Tartan did indeed require a bit more experience, commanding a fleet the size of the cunning Waz. 
When this Fernstone world was finally brought under his power, Cronan swore that he would bring this piratic parasite to bay, and then tear off his limbs, splash his blood to the four winds, then jump up and down on the bits before feeding them to Tiddles, who Cronan could then watch expel from his posterior only hours later. Now all of that is said and done. The overall update given as usual. Let us progress to the prime cuts of the matter. The battle against the Terrakids, the busting of the Buggins, the war to claim the guts of the Orcs of Omen. For, as we have heard last time, Cronin had broken the initial assault forces into a trident of terror. Three war bosses for the three prongs of the attack, one headed up by the ever vicious but ever loyal Git Squisher McMurder, the second ostensibly led by that weasel Grinner the Backstabber, and the last was posthumously under the command of tragic violence. A bit of a Johnny come lately, who was the cat pain generous of the lesion, tragic, had been shot out by a trying to flex. The ball of purple power that slapped the cat pain in the mush also was strong enough to turn his entire upper half into smush. Hence a third prong of the attack was now literally headless, and it was Cronan who would now barge in to lead this group of greenskinned warriors before the Buggins could surround, slaughter, and snaffle the lot. And so it was that Cronan took shuttle across to the Orcs of Omen at the head of a couple of hundred of his bodyguard, the mega armor nutters of his legion. Yet it was to prove less straightforward than that, for in Cronan's train was, of course, his pet squig, Tiddles. Now this caused a very strange affair indeed, for the squigs were usually seen wandering about the place, and nobody oft took any notice of them, until they were either hungry or being chewed on by a particularly aggressive wee ball of dental destruction. Yet this had also been changing. It seemed to be another side effect of the blessings of Mork. Yet another sign of the bounty of the god of cunning brutality unto Cronan. For the proliferation of the grots was one thing, the increase in the size of those who were closest to Cronan another, the sheer exhibitions of <sighs> thinking yet another. But now it seemed a greater blessing had just begun, for it passed as odd originally, but those who followed the chronicles with avid ears and cunning of their own will realize there was something very special about this squig. Tiddles was now of a size to even growl at a squigoth and not fear. Oh, the chances of him being anything but squashed into a pate by one was still astronomical, but it was a simple fact that Tiddles was now the largest baseline squig any had ever seen, and he had also been augmented by the strategic sowing of multiple mad boys to his posterior, all done during the preparation for the battle against Toba and the worshippers of the wimpy gods of chaos. But the problem was that these mad boys, they seemed to have been absorbed into tittles, and it became obvious to all that something was now going on with tittles. For he was able to transport himself where he should not be, had no logical or even orky way of getting to the places he did, and there had been reports of him appearing inside people's rooms and attempting to snaffle them. Well, the reports were more just evidence, really, for none survived his nocturnal snacking. Yet the evidence was overwhelming, mostly because it was a pile of dung that was not born of any normal orc body. And it left an odour so foully overwhelming as to only be possible from either the Great One himself, or his huge and perpetually hungry squig, Tiddles. But more than this, the other squigs acted differently when Tiddles was amongst them. Their fightiness and bitiness were sent skyrocketing. They would surround him and follow him wherever he went. As Cronan was unto the boys, Tiddles was unto the squigs. And strangely, Quite a few snots as well, <laughs> go figure. When Cronan's sheep landed on one of the many bays of the Orcs of Omen, the furore was real. Cronan walked down the gangplank, with other transports blurting out scores of his mega-armoured knobs. But as soon as a massive squig Tiddles appeared beside him, 
The bays were hit by a tsunami of bitey balls of hate, all wagging and waiting for their own master, Tiddles, the avatar of teeth, to show them the way. Now, on his procession to the place of pain, old Cronand was watching the feeds from the many vidgrots he had sprinkled amongst the usual ways of the diminutive wretches. And thus, he felt like a front row spectator in the carnage, for the groups were performing pretty much as expected, but not anything beyond the scope of the ken of the Lord of the Cunning War, Cronan. For he predicted that the forces under the late, and definitely not great, tragic violence would be in trouble, and that they were. For the buggins had smelt their discord, their lack of central control, and their panic. Hence, they were now initiating a plethora of flanking and sweeping actions that would indeed cut the forlorn group from their reinforcements. Cronan would act swiftly and decisively, as soon as he got there, of course. Yet the other two were now the main part of his concentration. And again, there was no surprise from those forces led by the whirlwind of destruction, Gitsquisher McMurder. They were doing quite nicely, all things considered. Gitsquisher had managed to retain some form of orky order, which wasn't saying much, but it was enough for those closest to him to hear, understand, and disseminate the orders he was constantly screaming at his mobs. Not that this interrupted his wholehearted indulgence in gratuitous violence, because nothing could really prevent this from such an orky orc as McMurder. Yet, he was managing to hold his force together and get it where he wanted it to be, doing what he wanted it to do, which was, of course, the smashing of the buggins. Cronan nodded his appreciation of the huge green merchant of desk generalship, as he then moved on to Grinner. Now Grinner the backstabber had begun the event in such a way as to make Cronan question his evaluation of the previously very suspect orc boss. For Grinner had practically ridden a wave of grots into the center of a breaching zone, then stood his ground and pulverized scores of buggins while holding out for his flash guard to catch him up. Yet, the moment of orky goodness had now been replaced with a decidedly un orky set of events. For Cronan had been watching Grinner quite carefully, trying to be fair, for he did not like Grinner originally, and being betrayed by the wretch, well, that had not exactly enamored Cronan to him. Yet, in the time since that wee faux pas, Grinner had proven to be the most trusty of servants. Also, he was always game for being the butt of many of Cronan's minor japes. Thus, Grinner had grown on the Lord of Cunning. Not like a wart, one of those nasty ones where the hair sticks out, nor like a mould or other fungi, nor even like a rising damp patch that simply won't shift no matter how dry the room is or how much you treat it. No. He had grown on Cronan like a scar that reminded him of a particularly good scrap. Or more to put it, Cronan did not wish to disembowel Grinner whenever he turned around a corner and bumped into him accidentally. Yet, after accruing so many good boy points, Grinner now went about spending them as fast as possible. And his estimation in Cronan's eyes dropped radically. Of course, there was also the matter of the hat. For Grinner's flash kits had shot out most of the grots near them in ludicrously unlucky events where the shooters just seemed to go off all by themselves whenever pointed at a vit grot. Yet, there were always more, and it was from the remaining vit grot feeds that Gronan could watch the strange goings on of the backstabber. And it was deeply concerning for Cronan. Well, it would have been if he were anything other than an orc, for they do not really have concerns. More it was something that made Cronan want to flatten Backstabber, for he had something that Cronan did not. An odd thing, a strange thing, a magical hat. Now Cronan would have made his way to Grinner right then and there, if he had suspected that Grinner's headgear was of the sort to attract and concentrate thinking, and ideas. Yet, this did not seem to be the case, for Cronan knew the exhaustion that would come from performing this most holy, yet terribly dangerous practice. Hence, he was not perturbed. 
What Cronan was interested in was the nature of the hat. Why did it have green lights coming out of it that created some form of holographic map? How did the hat know the layout of the Orcs of Omen? How by Mork's buttocks did the hat know the layout of the Orcs of Omen? Was Grinner using the hat? Was the hat, in fact, wearing Grinner? A terrible revelation that caused Cronan to almost stop in his tracks. Luckily, the nudging from about 40 of his guards slamming into his back propelled Cronan forward again on his journey. Hmm, mused Cronan. This hat issue had to be resolved, and swiftly, for Grinner was using the hat to do very odd things. Grinner's main force was indeed heading forward down the usual routes, being the main corridors into the centre of the space honk. Yet Grinner and his entourage seemed to be going up ramps, down staircases, across empty rooms, in a convoluted squiggly way that had no rhyme or reason. Each time Grinner came to a fork in the road, he would consult his hat. And from it would come these green lights that made up the schematics. It seemed impossible. Before Cronan believed it was just pitiful luck for him to avoid all of the good fighting. But no, it was not. For Cronan could clearly make out that Grinner was. Ugh. He was avoiding fights! Somehow, the scoundrel was ducking out of real scraps and heading towards almost entirely clear zones which the Buggins had vacated to get to the battlefront. Disgusting. Sidebar. The secret of the success of pirates. The helmet of Santango, the endowed. In an age mired in the sticky threads of ancient antiquity, most likely being about a decade ago, for the memory of the Greenskins is shorter than a kin's sideburns after being hit by a blast from the furnaces. There was once a corsair of prodigious, um, natural talent. And he made common cause with the powers of the Emperor. For his part in the pact, Saint Hungo ever used his powers for destroying the clean, the freighter, and the bitch. Yet Saint Hungo was also renowned for his prodigious, um, appetites. Hence he was gifted a power beyond the run of the mill, for with his prophetic peen he was able to predict the movements of his enemy. Not only did this really help with massive fleet engagements, but also in evading the existing paramours of his latest conquests when they eventually returned home. Thus, by using his peen's prophetic powers, could St. Hungo the Endowed extricate himself from near any trap or ambush before it ever closed? Alas! The only time this did not work was when he met the forces of Yane's Blonde in open void war. For the Smeldar are far more adept at pulling back the foreskins of the future than any Humi, even this most gifted and blessed of all pirates. Hence did St. Hungo meet his match, which proved more than one, and as a result, St. Hungo was forced onto his knees in defeat. It was with his small fruit-peeling blade the Jane's blonde ended the connection betwixt the pirate and his powerful peen. Yet, when all was said and done, the Smeldar prince dropped the peen out of the nearest airlock. Long hours did it float, unknown, unowned, forever twitching to get back to its master. And by luck, it is just about then that the sheep of Grinner did meander into the region looking for scrap or a scrap. It was here that Grinner was guided to claim the prophetic member via its green lambent light. Yet, he knew via a strangely transcendental dream that while he was known to possess the peen, he would never be able to live without looking over his shoulder. And considering his neck was incredibly short and his shoulders were as huge as any other orc war bosses, this could cause a severe lack of vision, one that would make him vulnerable forevermore. All would slay him for the powers of the peen, unless he hid them, unless he hid it. Hence did Grinner the Backstabber have created a fell garment indeed, the helmet of St. Hungo the Endowed, a hat with an eye patch over a secret aperture 
so it would only shine out its guidance when he wanted. And it was indeed Grinner's intention to dodge the main concentration of buggins, as if they were an irate husband armed with a set of white-hot todger-removing tongs. Sidebar over. And so it was that Cronan entered the Terrakid factory, his mighty con- um, Lucian at his back. And it was not long before Cronan got to the very seat of the problem. The U-Bend, the tragic violence, had simply not been able to flush. For there was the main corridor that had a time to flex at its end. The huge buggin had a mighty shooter that had already accounted for tragic, but there was simply no way around it. Now Cronan was not alone, as we know, and a segment of his lesion had already tried scouting ahead for love of their lord. Alas, this meant that when Cronan and Tiddle snugged their heads round the corner to take a peek or a shufty, they were greeted by the vista of a small shopping mall worth of smoking boots. To be fair, one or two sets were almost halfway down the corridor, and Cronan swelled with pride at the speed his mega-armoured knobs must have been booking it to get that far. Of course, Tiddles wanted to just charge down the corridor immediately, and there were a plethora of the balls behind him. In fact, the advent of Tiddles had begun to turn the tide all over the ship, for his minions, his fellow but lesser squigs, had now crawled into every air vent, conduit and catwalk, pouring into the buggins held region like a virus. There were clangs and the odd vent would explode, and downpours of squigs and little terracid buggins, called slippers, or something like that, would roll around in the floor, killing each other. Cronan again swelled with pride, for he could now feel the war around him, between himself and the air vents, his squigs and the buggins, even between himself and the trying to flex. It was truly epic. It was almost as if the air was alive with the very vibration of war, which of course it was. Sidebar. Spore Wars The true oddity of the orcs and the buggins was that they fought each other even on the microscopic level. For as each of the orcs died, they released a miasma of spores that floated out into the atmosphere, yet they were still orcoids. And thus, they wanted to not only plant themselves in a warm wet patch to grow, <clears throat> but they were also more than amply enthused with a good brawl. The buggins for themselves also alter the very atmosphere of any location they inhabit. Tiny spores from the terracids would change the landscape, the air, the very water, preparing all of it for consumption by the high fleet. Hence the two agents in the air, across every surface, orcoid spores and buggin bacteria, fought each other viciously. As each buggin slew an orc, they added to the strength of the microscopic warriors. Yet, as the orcs marched across the sheep, burning everything in their path, they were destroying the very means of producing reinforcements for this conflict. Thus, with every step they took and every buggin stack they burnt, the orcs were beating the buggins back again and again. It was glorious. Sidebar over. And so it was. The Cronan knew what he had to do, for this was like the riddle of the boxes. Um, well, okay, that was a stretch but it was a conundrum nonetheless. For Cronan knew he could dispatch the triant effects if he ever got in close with the colossal bugger. Yet, to get there would mean taking more than a few shots from the orc puddle generating mega shooter that seemed to be growing out of its hands like a particularly nasty line of snot that comes attached to your finger after a good rubbage. You know, the kind that no matter how you flick, it always just sticks. Hence you have to rub it off on a passing grot or snot. Stringy, you know. Anyway, Cronan did not mess about. He knew three things immediately. Number one, Tiddles would follow him wherever he went. Number two, the buggin could fire at least twice, probably thrice, if he just hoofed it along the corridor. And three, he needed to do something soon, as more of his lesion were charging in there whilst he deliberated. The pressures of command, eh? And so it was that Cronan was molested by another idea. 
but one he wholeheartedly endorsed this time. It wasn't like the last bunch of ideas from yesterday, or was it the day before? In either case, the idea to make a grot shrinker so he could keep one in his ear for emergency cogitations, well, it seemed like a good idea at first, but then Cronan remembered that the grots did tend to wee a lot. The thought of a miniature grot peeing in his ear forced Cronan to scupper the plan immediately. Nor was the thought of expanding his fists a good one, if truth be told. For Cronan initially thought that he would be able to hit bigger things, grab and throttle things, like those massive kites of the Humies. You know, the ones about the size of a stomper or more. How he could grab a foot and then use it to smash up other kites. But it dawned on Cronan that this situation would make bogey flicking near impossible. For the thought of having a good nasal cavity clean-out, with fingers the size of a Land Raider Crusader, well, it seemed impractical and potentially very ouchy. And Cronan did stumble upon the concept of it being, well, a tad sacrilegious, really. For was he not the impressive height and terrifying girth due to the blessings of his guard? Was he not exactly the right size for the task Mork had set before him? Of course he was. Hence, the fist beginner was also revoked. Now Isaac Newton and Happy Len were particularly disappointed, so they said that they would make it anyway and use it on Humies. A bit of market research. As ideas went, Cronan saw that it was good. But where were we? Ah yes, the conundrum of the corridor. Now Cronan was indeed an almost uniquely driven greenskin, and although he understood his pace and import, that the war would literally tear itself apart if we were to fall. And yet, he was still an orc. And he wanted to give the tyrant of flex the gifts of Mork. <laughs> Hence his idea made him chortle, and then he gave the order. Within a minute, he had three of his legion on either side, each in Meganob armor, of course. And so, two grabbed an arm and one a leg on either side of his bulk, and they began to swing him back and forth in unison. Now to say that the first six knobs got this right was a massive overestimation. He did go through two entire groups before they got it right. The first being snaffled by Tiddles, who construed them as attacking his lord. But when Cronan had a nice calm chat between Tiddles' nose and the cunning one's fist, he seemed to get the point that his master was in no danger. Well, not from the lifting knobs at any rate. But in any case, the third try was the charm as the six knobs' armor clanked and squealed under the effort, but Cronan was building up a lot of momentum as he was swung back and forth. Then, at his mighty command, they let go. And Cronan slammed into the wall of the corridor and then slid down it like a toboggan. The oddity of it being that he rolled so that it was his front that was slammed against the wall and floor as he sped like a bullet towards his quarry. He needed to keep his butt as a first line of defense. The triant effects unleashed a ball of plasmatic death towards our hero, yet as it came to destroy him, it splashed against an egg shield of power. The shield took most of the hit, Cronan's mega shiny mega armor absorbing the splash easily. Now, issue one immediately came into place, as Tiddles charged after his master. But when the blast came, the avatar of teeth flashed a brilliant green, then disappeared. Cronan smirked as he slid, his nose being pushed up beyond his forehead at the time as it dragged across the surfaces. Cronan knew that this was the moment he was either a genius or about to become a smoking blamange. For the Terrakid trying to flex should surely fire just once more before he struck it, yet Cronan flew out of the corridor and directly into the thing's back with both feet his boots smashing into his tail as he screeched to a stop. He looked up to see what he had hoped would happen. For now, the trying to flex was tugging and pulling as if its head were about to come off, which is exactly true. For in the desperation of the moment, Tiddles had performed his new party trick and had teleported next to the thing attacking his lord. Cronan stood up and took out his mighty chopper and rushed around the bulk of the buggin. And there he got forward, as he saw the head of the trying to flex inside the maw of the Avatar of Teeth. It had its arms between the jaws of Tiddles, 
and was barely keeping him from finishing his bite, which would tear its head clean off, of course. Tiddles was growling and shaking as he tried to get the bug in to accept his dental delivery. But Tiddles now wagged his tail as one of his tiny eyes watched Cronan come round the bug in. The trying to flex hit the ball of teeth with its gun as it could not get it pointed directly at him, but it suddenly went still, for Cronan had beheaded it in one fell swoop. Which was a bit of a shock to Tiddles, really. As Cronan turned to give his pet a swift hug, he saw Tiddles still had crossed eyes from where Cronan's chopper had passed so close to his face. Yet the moment was shattered by the screeching of small gun buggins. They had rushed in to witness the death of the trying to flex and unloaded into Cronan and Tiddles. Yet, at this point, there was another roar. For the Black Legion had discerned that their lord was not a smoking pile, hence they had charged down the corridor themselves. The Buggins fired their barbers, or something like that, at Cronan. Yet his armor was the finest of muggins, the most impressive of shiny pets. And, and also, his butt-held power field generator had recovered. Hence all of the shots bounced off, and Tiddles hid behind his master for but a second, as the Black Legion leapt from the corridor in their scores. They unleashed their shooters into the Barbrigades, and any who weathered the fire were soon dispatched in the best way possible, by chopper action. Well, power claw, boot and headbutt also, of course. But the point is that they were crushed in close quarter combat, the only one that truly counted. And so, the bottleneck had been breached, the dam torn apart. And now lesion knobs and oceans of squigs were pouring forward. Grots too, of course, but they were hardly worthy of the mentioning. Well, apart from the vid grots. Alas, things were not as smooth as they could be. But then, where would be the fun if things went as expected? For in the next region, there were whole new buggins to fight. Excellent. For the next few rooms and regions were a messy battle indeed, for none could see more than a few paces in front of them due to a deep icky fog that permeated the air. The rooms were filled with venom ropes. They had odd fat bodies that had a veritable squid's worth of long tentacles. Although they were not particularly nifty and close, they made everything more challenging. For these wiggly buggins were not the main event at all. They were just hiding the next adventure in battlefield butchery. For out of the muck and mire came an avalanche of utter animals. The orcs were generally moving forward with quite a lot of joviality. The jocularity of the situation was side-splitting, as the greenskins all made wafting movements over their noses, and more than a few attempted to add to the miasma with their own trouser coughs. Alas, in their enthusiasm, more than a few simply followed through which of course was loud and squitty and led to even more guffawing. It was in the midst of this silliness that they, the Buggins, struck. The air could almost be seen to move as blood-curdling screams filled it. Now these weren't good, honest, deep-throated orky screams. These were not bellows of defiance or calls to combat. These were blood-curdling screeching affairs that made more than a few of the boys cease their laughter and the Buggins came out of the fog like a thunderbolt. Well, if a thunderbolt was about twenty foot tall, spat bioplasmatic death, and had four colossally stabby and rippy limbs made of hate. And so it was that a stream of fillers barreled into the orc lines. Yet, were these not Cronan's elite forces, his black lesion? The massive monsters came in hard, and their initial onslaught was devastating. When Cronan strode forward, his knobs, mobs, and boys came with him. Now, Cronan had not brought Hack Nien with him on this particular jaunt, for he was saving that up for a proper fight. For Cronan considered this just a bit of fun, like a bouncy castle, whatever that was, but with spikes and randomly appearing lava flows. He would always take a rumble seriously, of course, but he did not really consider this sort of fray that eventful. Well, eventful was not exactly the word, for Cronan had to drop his chopper and shooter to grab two of the very pointy talons that the streamer filler before him had managed to get past his reach. Yet he had already shorn off the other two from the beast, so he did not mind leaving his gut open. And so it was that Cronan then pulled the arms of the baggin back 
and broke them like kindling. The thing thrashed as much as a drukari at a whipping contest, but Cronan just planted his head into its face until the buggin was just a headless mush on the floor. Now Cronan would have been slain in this event too, as he was getting so into the headbutting that he lowered his guard. Yet his trusty pet saved him once again. As another stream of filler came in, Tiddles jumped on it and bit into its face and upper body. The thing was then dragged down by an avalanche of squigs who were attempting to help Tiddles, the avatar of teeth. And so it was that the black lesion also cut and broke, ripped and tore into the Goliaths. They had even more fun with these ones than the corny flexors. And when the waves of the fillers stopped, there was a small groan from the lines of greenskins. Well, more of a moan of, oh, is it over already, type affair. And when the streamers were all dead, they all went on to catch and kill every last one of the squiggly venom ropes. So with spirits high and weapons wet, Cronan led his forces even deeper into the Terrigid factory. Cronan flicked a quick look at the screens of the Vidgross, just to keep abreast of the progression of the attack elsewhere. Now, Gitzkusha McMurder had a definite lead on Cronan, for he had been in the first wave and not experienced the hold-up to Cronan's forces, as they were previously led by the now smoking boots of Tragic. And so it was that McMurder had passed his own trials. His prong had been engaged by a vast rank of buggin chopper and blaster gits. Standing just about the size of a knob, these ones seemed more organized, more closely packed and far more stable. Hence, they were packed in quite deep when the orcs hit their lines. The bony swords of the Buggin warriors cut straight through even mega armor, so there was almost a bank of dead orc boys before the main lines of the Buggins. Yet, when McMurder hit their line, they buckled. He was as wrathful as a librarian who has a visit by the society for whispering slightly too loudly while slowly reading out, but bursting into tears and snot bubble misery when this is pointed out, no matter how politely. An odd and long-named society, it is true. Yet, all is possible in the grim darkness of the far future. Anyways, McMurder was a thing of pure rage and stabbiness. He swung his power claw like a baton twirler at a parade, and there was nothing but buggin' bits left in his wake. As the greenskins piled into the gap he created, the buggin' block disintegrated. With grots and squigs now covering the floors and ripping at anything not aware of them, the boys took the buggin' blades on their choppers, and the buggins were ripped asunder. At this rate, McMurder would be at the centre of the hive before Cronan. But then, things had been so fun, Cronan would not begrudge it even if he was pipped at the post. But when Cronan attempted to view Grinner the Backstabber's thrust, all he could see were the boys and knobs. It seemed that Grinner and his flash kit had managed to kill every last Vidgrot who had followed the hat-wearing weasel. Cronan had no doubt that it was now between himself and McMurder, and he was also pretty certain that Grinner would come up with some excuse about being lost in the winding corridors or something like that. Miserable. What kind of an orc was Grinner? Was he an orc at all? Perhaps he was actually a modified Humi. Something like an arse starter, modified to look like an orc. But then, mused Cronan swiftly, he doubted even an arse starter, a spaced marine, would avoid crumping to this miserable degree. To Cronan, of all the fathoms ever conceived, this surely was the most honourable. For no true orc was ever afeard of crumping, nor, more especially, being crumped. And in some small way, Cronan had the right of the matter. For the orcs did not suffer from the most prevalent and potent of all curses across the entire Warhammer universe. Sidebar. The curse of Hazagorot, the Shite-Flinger. Now it is a well-known self-evident truism that most beings are utterly bowel-liquefyingly terrified of passing their sell-by fate. And by that, I don't mean developing a middle-aged sped or sag, nor becoming a bit whiffy via continence and confidence eroding accidents and the like, or reaching for something too high in a supermarket and having that twinge that prophesies a week of laying on a couch and dissolving into hot baths to release the discomfort and looking longingly back to the days when putting on socks 
was a mere task and not a barely possible trial. No. I refer, of course, to the final and ultimate inconvenience. Passing on, pushing up daisies, pining for the fjords, etc., etc., et al., et al. In a word, death. For it is not as simple as saying that sentience equates to awareness of the finality of it all. In the grim darkness of the far future, the entire galaxy is also laboring under a terrible malady. The curse of Hazagorot, the shite flinger. For he was once a godlike being, a cat, sorry, catpan. And he was so brutal, so terrible, that he affected the psyche of all who now dwell in the Milky Way galaxy. And thus, the image of death to many is the very visage of Hazagorot. When the war in heaven was at its very height, he was destroyed, shat into a million pieces by his own slaves. Yet, his influence has been so suffocating that all sentient beings now fear his presence, and they fear death. Yet, the Krook, the ancestors of the good and honest orcs, were spared from this horrific psychosis. Now the Smeldar state that they too had no fear of death, but this was because, like the milksops that they are, they knew it would not be permanent. For the Smeldar could reincarnate. Well, they could before the advent of She Who Thrusts. And the Fat One, the Bookie Bird, and the Juice God, of course. Now, without this little Get Out of Purgatory free card, they have succumbed to the curse as well. So, to put a pin in this one, the whole galaxy is scared of an old cat, sorry, Catman, who has been shat into a million pieces many millions of years ago. Silly isn't it? And so, the orcs are not conscious nor scared of any threat to their lives. Well, some are. Like a grot staring at a knob in mid-crumping, yet this is probably more the wish to avoid pain, not death. But the fear of death does not affect the real orcoids. Anything larger than a grot. Um, okay, well that leaves orcs and squiggoth. But the point stands. Orcs do not fear death so they do whatever absolute ridiculousness that comes into their heads whenever they wish, wherever they wish. <laughs> Sidebar over. And so it was. The Cronin was again brought back to the affray at hand, for his forces now pushed into a different area entirely. He could feel he was getting closer to the central hub of the Buggins, for they now came out at his forces in a slathering rage. All pretense at him, well, previous subtlety, utterly subsumed in the sheer joy of combat. Or that is how Cronan liked to view it, at the least. Yet, Cronan was in paroxysms of pleasure when he stepped into the next room, for there were these gorgeous buggins, things of true wonder. He knew their names. He had seen them on his beloved data slate, but the pics and the description, at least this time, had been utterly and woefully incapable of doing it justice for the hearty flexors before him were lovely. With eyes like saucers filled with wonder, Cronan basked in the butchery. He even considered bellowing for one to be taken alive, for what a phenomenal pet it would make. Yet Cronan then looked into the wide eyes of his most beloved, his huge and gnashy tiddles, the avatar of teeth. What need he for some huge nasty thing to be kept under a trapdoor, leading into a pit with this beast underneath? Oh, the fun would be astonishing. Yet how could he replace or supplant his own kin, his own besotted and loyal tiddles? He found he could not. Hence he decided to do the next best thing and get in on the action. Tiddles waggled his tail as he followed Cronan into the melee. But what was so exciting about the hearty flexors? Well, they were just a cornucopia of crushing and killing. Their body bulk was the size of a corniflex, or perhaps even a Tracy gone. But it had two huge crushing claws at the front, and wonder of wonders, a maw filled with tentacles and teeth so prolific, it was like looking down into a squig pen at feeding time. But the piece de resistance was a long tongue that came lashing out and grabbed even knobs and dragged them back into its gob hole. Like a massive frog, whatever that was, sitting on a lily pad, swatting juicy flies out of the skies. Cronan was in love. 
Well, he would have been if the Greenskins had the capacity, which they do not. The trade-off for not succumbing to the curse, one would imagine. Ah well, in either case, the hearty flexors were like a one-beast training machine. For they jabbed out with their tongue, then came at you with their tentacles, all while you had to duck and roll away from the gratuitous crushing pincers in their forelimbs. And Cronan hogged three to himself, then went on to share with Tiddles, as they butchered their way through a half dozen of the monsters. Good times. Good times. Yet, as with all good things, it could not last. For McMurder was now finishing off his own hearty flexors, meaning he was neck and neck with Cronan now. His power was substantial, but he was no match for the cunning one. Or, of course, the fact that Cronan had the Black Lucian with him, and McMurder only had boys. Hence, he had taken a bit more time with the stream of fillers and hearty flexor waves. Now the two forces were converging on opposite sides of the main and last region, still held by the Buggins. With a last flick of his eyes over the vid screens, Cronan could already see the stretcher bearers of the Grotz coming into the war zone and rushing out again fully burdened. Now most would think that the stretchers would be for wounded orcs, yet this was not the case. For the Grotz were already swiping all of the Buggins to chain-gang them to the transports ready for the victory banquet. Their galleys were being fired up all across the war fleets, and the Grotz did not want to miss out. Hence, they ran like the clappers. And so, we get to the finale, on to the Triant. And so it was, the Cronan led his forces to the last door. With a monumental effort of his boys, they unleashed Daka like a river into it. Then, when everyone was clean out of ammo and the door was still there, the megat armored knobs of the Legion charged the doors, only for them to be bowled out of the way, and, as has been noted before in the Chronicles, Tiddles went at it like a trooper. He bashed at the door and bit into it as much as his teeth would gain purchase. He clawed and spat and gobbled and chomped, and within less than a minute, there was a hole large enough for even the meatiness of the cunning one to simply step through, which of course, Cronan did. The changes in the room were wall to wall, ceiling to floor, as this had been indeed the veritable Axis Mundi of the Buggins. Everything was sticky and slick with ick, yet this would not stop the first son of Orcolonia. Oh, no, it would not. Cronan espied the door burst open on the other side of the room, and there stood McMurder, panting and grinning. Not like Grinner the Backstabber, of course, with his sly eyes and barely curled lips. Nay, this was a truly toothy, orky grin, the grin of the righteous. Cronan and he locked eyes and raised their blades in salute. This would be a race to the middle, oh, yes it would. And so it was, that McMurder and Cronan, Tiddles and all of the knobs, mobs, grots and squigs, all raised their voices and exalted praise as they bellowed. And then they went about the good deed of the day the death of the last and largest Buggins. For in this last room, the Triant, the big brain Buggins in charge, had surrounded himself with a wall of weird warriors. The main line were these blind bugs with helmets for faces. They were incredibly heavily armored and would not budge from their positions in defense of their lord. These were the Triant Guard. Yet around the edges slithered long and lusty Buggins that could tower up on their coils and reach to the very top of the bay. They were huge. These were Targones, or something like that. And so, the Buggins held their ground and fought like, well, like really angry wasps when you're about to accost their queen. Like they were exceptionally stabby and bitey indeed. Cronan was forced to ride Tiddles to get the kind of elevation he required to really do some damage to the tall ones, the Targones. He could see his boys all surrounding this last island of Buggins, and it was hilarious. There was utter carnage. Yet, he could also see that McMurder was now right in amongst the Triant Guard. At any moment, he could just take one or two more lucky swings and clear enough space to get at the big Buggins. Yet, there became time for Cronan. As the big Buggin fired a massive shooter down at McMurder, and he was forced to roll backwards to avoid being turned into sludge. 
Of course, the guard of the big bug then closed ranks, and it was as if McMurder was never amongst them. He was no lickspittle or lollygagger, and he simply brushed himself off and went back in for the kill. Yet, all of his previous effort was wasted, and he was back to square one. Cronan trotted Tiddles back from the main engagement, preparing to charge a line of buggins. Tiddles seemed to know exactly what was planned. As he dug in his claws a few times to test the purchase he had on the floor, he was preparing to leap just as Cronan intended. Hence they charged forward, and when Cronan grabbed Tiddles' eyebrow region and dragged it up, the squig did indeed launch himself into the air. Yet something truly amazing happened just as they did. For as Cronan was launched up, he could see a strange square of sparks coming from the ceiling. A square of flames licking around, which then dropped out of the ceiling. It landed directly in front of the Terrigid Tyrant, only barely missing the thing as it hopped backwards out of the way. And there stood before the buggin, on the square of metal that had been burnt out of the deck above, stood Grinner da Backstabber and five of his Flashkit's guard. The Flashkits had formed a semicircle to the back of Grinner, so when the whole buggin line turned to protect their lord, they were, of course, absolutely smashed, not only by the Flashkits, but also by those with whom they had already been fighting tooth and claw. But Grinner's Flashkits kept them back just long enough for the wretch to leap at the big buggin. Grinner now exhibited that rage he had displayed in the opening waves of the battle, and Cronan yet again was shocked by the fury of this boss. For Grinner swung his power claw and chopper so fast, they were blurs. And within only a few seconds, the big buggin was dead. The triant had been killed. And the battle was over. Well, there was about half an hour of melee raging, as the buggins went stark staring tonto all over the place when their big bug died. Yet their cohesion was shattered, their lines dissolved. Now it was solitary buggins here and there being taunted and torn apart by the boys, or of course the squigs. All the while, Grinner just stood above the dead lead buggins, with his mighty chopper in hand and the head of the buggin in the other. Now Cronan had two choices. On the one hand, Cronan was rather knocked off by his missing out on his leap being the end of the affair and he taking the head of the big buggins personally. Yet he had the second issue, for he was actually elated. He was more relieved than he had been since he saw Tiddles at the base of the tree of Woohoo back in the camp of Tooth Slasher and Toba when all seemed lost. He was that happy. You see, he was a cunning orc, as we know, but he was also a proud orc, as any truly orky orc should be. The previous trust in Grinner had been misplaced, he had thought, and that would not be good. Yet, he had not turned out to be a sniveling, grot-hugging coward. The sinking feeling Cronin had when he watched Grinner on the vids had been vile, for he had thought that Grinner was worthless. And, as Cronan had permitted him to be one of his own big bosses, well, that sort of horrific calumny had a habit of being passed from the originator to all those associated with him. And that would definitely mean the cunning one himself. Grinner the Backstabber was different. All knew this. For was he not a freebooter? And they were all known to be a bit touched in their head. So, it seemed that he had adapted to his experiences was the sum of all he had seen and done. Hence, he had already learned to be nearly as goal-oriented as other runty races. Not ideal, Cronan had to concede, yet Grinner was no coward. His blood was as green as the next good orky orc, and he had pulled off a blinder. For none could deny that he had been cunning, and had not Cronan demanded that all of his war consider the application of this dark art as a form of religious sacrament. Well, not that he would have put it that way, but it was true nonetheless. And hence, the big buggins boss and all the little buggins were now dead. The squigs and snots and grots would hunt down injured or, or hiding bugs over the next few days. The orcs of Omen was now cleared of all but the greenskins. Cronan had shown his dominance over the buggins, and of course, over the orcs of Omen itself. 
for it was now totally, completely, and irrevocably owned by Cronan. Cronan knew in his gut that he could not do what he wanted to do next, and it vexed him mightily. For the urge to stomp up to Grinner and simply commandeer the strange headgear from him was rife. Cronan had to fight the urge with all of his fibre, for Grinner had pulled off a blinder and burst a big bug in. It would raise all hell if he were to then dishonour this warrior by stealing what was clearly his. Oh, if it were booty, he could have simply claimed it as a big boss, but let's not get started on booty again. Yet, all had seen Grinner in said headgear many, many times before, and it would not do to snatch it now. For better or worse, for at this moment, Grinner was the orc of the hour, and Cronan could do nothing but walk up to him and raise his arm into the air, a sign of the acknowledgement of Grinner's victory from Cronan. Cronan had to reward good effort, never punish it. So the hat, which we of course know is actually the helmet of St. Hungo the Endowed, would have to wait for a more auspicious time. And so it was that Cronan joined the celebration feast with all of his boys, knobs and bosses. Grinner was enjoying his moment in the spotlight, yet Cronan did not begrudge this for him either. To make sure he did not go into a rage and slaughter everyone present in a peak of jealousy, Cronan decreed that the feast would indeed be hatless. Out of sight, out of mind. At least while he was imbibing, the Herculean quantities of grog now being wantonly splashed about. It was a good day, and it would lead to many more. For as soon as the war had claimed and stockpiled all of the buggins, it was time to take a tour with his brand new Space Hulk mega sheep, the Orcs of Omen. And Cronan, in his infinite cunning, knew exactly where he wanted to go first. Coming next time, Cronan and the sentient psychophone of Ramalama Ding Dong 4. <laughs>